time for my notes. <laughs> I think that's pretty suspect if you ask me. She has never been seen again. There has been no trace of her. Yeah. Hey guys, welcome to or welcome back to my channel. If you're new, thank you so much for clicking on my video. And if you're a subscriber, thank you so much for joining my little family we got going on here. It has gotten so much bigger recently and it literally just warms my heart and I hope that you are here and loving my videos and if you are a returning viewer, OG, thank you a little bit extra. So today's video is going to be something different. It's the first video of its kind that I am doing and I'm really excited but also nervous. I adore and love Bella Fiore and Bailey Sarian here on YouTube if you know who either of them are. They are both beauty channels, but they also talk about true crime. Um, Bella has a Mystery Monday series, and Bailey Sarian does a Murder, Mystery, and Makeup Monday series as well, and I've always wanted to do something like that on my channel, even before, you know, seeing those videos. I just has always wanted to kind of incorporate somehow makeup and, like, stuff like that. I don't know. I think it's so cool, and so this is totally not original, okay? Not at all. And every one of these videos, I'm going to leave their channels and maybe a couple videos below especially if they've done one on the topic that i'm going to be discussing so this is going to be my first what i want to call them is sketchy sundays so i want to upload these on a sunday for sure whenever i do them um and i just wanted to give it like a cute little series name but specifically today is special and i'm going to get into it in just a second obviously you can see what we're talking about by the title and i'm not going to be instructing on like what I'm doing makeup wise. I'm just gonna simply do my makeup. I have literally two back-to-back -back pages of notes for this case. So if you see me looking down or reading off of them at all, that is why. But that is gonna be my focus, not the makeup. I will list what I can in the description and definitely do like a post on Instagram as well with like the final, the final look. So let's stop rambling. Let's just get into the Maura Murray case. Basically, I wanted to do this case because my first video in this series, I wanted to do a local case, something from my state. I'm from Massachusetts, if you don't know. And um, I feel like the most well-known case from Massachusetts is Lizzie Borden, that axe murderer, which that's been done a bunch of times. And I feel like even for me, a lot of people in my state don't know about this case. So that's why I want to do it. She was born on May 4th, 1980. 82 in Massachusetts. So this takes place in her college years and the time that all this happened was actually this is today that you're seeing this video is the 16th anniversary of her disappearance. So that was another reason why I wanted to get this up on a Sunday and today of all days it was perfect like everything just worked out. This goes all the way back so 16 years ago today is February 9th 2004. So to think about back to this time technology was just starting but it was not anywhere near like how it is today. Basically the main form of social media at this time is Facebook. You don't have Snapchat where you can look at where people are. You don't have send me your location. You don't have any of that. So just, it makes it easier. I think when you look back at cases back then, it makes it easier for people to disappear and not know what happened to them because social media is so huge in that now and like even surveillance and just stuff like that. Now we're also talking about Western Massachusetts, okay? so. Many of you, if you are not from Massachusetts and you are, you know, what you hear, you just think of Boston, right? I was born outside Boston. I know the area. I know Eastern Mass. And that's what most people know about if they're not from Massachusetts. But they're a whole other side to this state. And I'm not just saying that because I'm from Western Mass. Like, I live in Western Mass. A lot of people don't know about it. And it's so different than the other side of the state. It is very rural and there's just not many cities. Like even the cities are just much, much smaller. It's a totally different kind of landscape. You obviously are not by the sea. You are surrounded by mountains and it's just totally different, okay? So, and that's becomes important to the story. So just a tiny bit of background information on Mora. <laughs> she did actually have kind of a history um, of getting into trouble. Now she was a state champ for track and Western Mass track is huge. We have a lot of really, really, really good track teams out here, but she unfortunately was also bulimic. So she had her own, you know, personal struggles as we all do. So not to speak any less of her or anything at all, but she did also get into some trouble growing up. I believe she shoplifted um, and she was actually expelled previously from a different college. I forget which one before this happened. She was at a different 
school and so now in 2004 when this all takes place she's at umass amherst it's pronounced amherst not amherst just so you know which literally is my backyard like so many people i know have gone to that school i have many friends who've gone there i thought about going there myself it just wasn't my my path i went to community college first and then when it came time to four-year school my life changed it's, it's a whole thing but anyway that is like truly if you are going to a well-known university you're going to either the one in my town or you're going to umass amherst so or any of the umasses really because they're just all good but if you're going locally that's kind of like the place to be so for me it's strange and it's like this happened in my backyard literally so it's kind of crazy and i believe at umass she was a nursing student medical nursing student something like that um so that was you know like her background so she had already had issues with her prior school and now um at umass at this time she was actually in trouble for stealing another student's credit card and she was charged with credit card fraud it wasn't a lot of money but still she was already you know in past trouble so now she was on probation and she just wasn't you know she just wasn't on the right path i guess you could say i don't know what kind of you know what led her to where to do what she was doing i don't know if she had any compulsion or you know if she was a kleptomaniac or anything like that or if she was just a broke college kid like all of us and trying to make ends meet you know who knows everyone does their own things for their own reasons so that's just kind of like her backstory leading up until now so now you know in 2004 it's the winter semester obviously when this happened february of 04 so she's enrolled and um she is on probation and she also worked at the school as a security guard so she you know like a like an ra i guess kind of but a little bit higher than that so she was a security guard for umass what's interesting about this case is that you don't know once she disappeared, there was basically no other evidence. The majority of the evidence in this case is about before she disappeared and like what led up to it. And that's what's kind of sketchy and why people think there's so much more to the story. It could be a very simple answer, but it also could be like a very strange answer. And there was just a lot of strange things that occurred beforehand that just make it all the more sketchy. <laughs> Okay, so now we're really gonna get into the bulk of the case. I just wanted to give you that like background info. So she, as we all know, disappeared on February 9th, 2004, 16 years ago today. And the series of events leading up to her disappearance start four days prior on February 5th. So on February 5th at night, she was working at the desk, I guess, like the front desk doing her security job. Um, so she was working it was late at night i don't know if she was just working till midnight or the overnight shift it's kind of unclear like reports tell you different things or it's just not crystal clear but anyway it doesn't matter because her shift she ended up leaving her shift early so she received two phone calls this night the first one being from one of her sisters she had two sisters i believe this was her younger sister that called her and that was at 10 30 p.m the second phone call was from an anonymous phone number at 1 a.m and after this phone call, she seemed very distraught as if something had happened or, you know, she obviously just found out some bad news. And we know this because her supervisor had come in and saw her like this after the phone call. So her supervisor let her leave and walked her back to her dorm. She said that Mora was just very distraught. Um, and the only kind of clue that she gave her supervisor was that she had t spoken to her sister beforehand Even though the second phone call wasn't from her sister Maybe the second phone call had something to do with her sister that she had just been talking to and the supervisor didn't really want to leave Mora alone But Mora was like, I'm gonna be okay. Like it's just a bad night, but I'll be okay. Thank you I don't need to stay with me. I have a roommate which was a lie but that also could have just been like I'm fine You know, you don't have to stay here with me, whatever something interesting that happened 30 minutes prior to the 1 a.m. phone call. Oh God, talking and doing your browser is very difficult, but I'm gonna try here. 30 minutes, a half an hour before the 1 a.m. phone call, there was a really, really bad hit and run on campus. The driver was never found, um, but the man that was hit, a st another student, it was very bad. He suffered a lot of um, trauma, head trauma, so he was never the same really. You know, he had a very severe traumatic brain injury and um, so it was just kind of an odd coincidence. Maybe she knew someone who, maybe she knew the person who hit them or maybe she knew the guy who got hit. It's kind of unclear, but that would maybe be why she was so distraught. Maybe she got a phone call about that, but that's just unknown, but that does come into play a little bit later into like a potential theory. So, so now moving on, 
um, a couple days ahead, like, well, about a day ahead because we're at early morning on the 6th at this point. So now fast forward to February 7th. Maura's dad was coming to visit. I guess she had an old, pretty old beat up car that just didn't really run well. It was always breaking down and everything. So her dad was going to take her car shopping. He had just gotten a brand new car himself, a brand new Toyota Corolla. So then after they went car shopping, they met up with one of her friends from school. I think her name was Kate. They met up with her for lunch. And one thing that Kate had reported after all this happened, um, when they were trying to confirm if uh, Maura and her dad really were car shopping this day, because there were no, um, there was no proof. It was all, you know, hearsay, like their words. There wasn't any, they didn't buy a car, so there was no transaction to prove it, anything like that. Um, Kate said that they didn't mention at all that they had gone car shopping. And I feel like that's something, you know, when you meet someone, I feel it like for lunch or dinner, whatever it was, I feel like one of the first things you do is like, how's your day? What did you do today? You know, like, why is your dad visiting? Did you guys do anything fun? I, I think that's a little strange. And a lot of people agree with that too, that it was never mentioned. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. Could have just been really uneventful. Or maybe, you know, some people are really private about like their finances that maybe they didn't want to know that her dad was buying her new car. Who knows? Anyway. So just kind of weird. And again, these are all just strange little things that lead up to her disappearance. So after dinner, Fred, the dad, brought both Kate and Maura to the liquor store. Um, there were some inconsistencies with his story here where he said that he waited outside for them. And then he also changed his story at one point saying that he actually went inside with them but told them to hurry up. I don't know. It just Again, just some weird inconsistencies that don't seem to matter, but it is weird with all these little white lies from multiple people before everything happened, you know? Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. So, they went to the liquor store because they are going to a party at night. So, they went and, of course, picked up some liquor. They didn't end up getting a car, like I said. So, his dad let them borrow his brand new car that he just bought. Knowing they're going to a party and probably drinking, I think that is strange. I mean, maybe he just really trusted them. Who the frick knows? Um, but I thought that was weird. Anyway, and it, of course it comes into play. Every, every little thing comes into play later. So they had her dad's car for the night and they were going to this party together. So around 2.30 a.m. they were leaving the party. There was mixed reports saying whether Amora left alone or if she left with a boy. There's no confirmation but it kind of seemed like she left alone because we don't hear about a boy any further into the story and we'll learn later about her long distance boyfriend so he obviously a long distance boyfriend was not there so she's leaving the party around 2 30 in the morning not with kate kate is no longer part of the story she just went to the party with her kate must have found her own way home or whatever something like that but then around 3 30 a.m she crashes her dad's brand new car and she's clearly distraught. Um, it hasn't ever been confirmed if she was drinking and driving. I don't know if they could um, prove it either with breathalyzers or anything. She obviously had been drinking that night, but who knows if she was really drunk driving. She crashed into like a, um, a guardrail. So then the police dropped her back off at her dad who was staying at a motel, dropped her back off. He seemed like not that bothered, honestly, about his car. He was just worried about getting home and to work the next day like I don't know kind of strange my dad would literally like I wouldn't want, want to know what my dad would do first of all my dad wouldn't even let me borrow his new car but that's just me so anyway at about 4 45 in the morning she ended up calling her long distance boyfriend his name was Billy he was in the military and I don't remember where he was stationed did I write that down I didn't write down where he was stationed but it was definitely far far away and in the U.S. still not like in another country um, but she called him and he kind of just calmed her down and was like, look, we'll talk more tomorrow. Like, I'm sorry that that happened that you had a bad night, but we'll talk more tomorrow. We also find out that they were both cheating on each other. I don't know if they both knew about this. They both seemed to be very much in love, but it seemed like the distance was taking a toll on both of them, but neither one of them wanted to like cut the cord. And that's anyone's own prerogative. That's their relationship. So, you know, whatever. But that was just something to note. So her dad ended up renting a car and then bringing her back to her dorm and he went home. So now that was on the, the 8th and now we are on February 9th. This is the day that she disappeared. So on the morning of the 9th, February 9th, 2004, she uh, did a few things that we could record and like that were recorded um, that they looked back on, of course, when investigating. So the first thing that she did was she looked up directions via MapQuest because that's what you had to do back in the day, guys. And she looked up directions to Burlington, Vermont, which is actually, um, 
It's a cute little town. She also emailed her boyfriend saying sorry that she didn't respond earlier, she wasn't in a good place, and that they would talk later. She also called about um, a condo that her family had previously rented. Oh my god, that is so cool. Had previously rented, I guess, while they were on vacation or something. Um, but it was unavailable. This was in New Hampshire. So it's kind of unsure where exactly her destination was. It seemed like she was clearly trying to go somewhere, but we don't know if it was New Hampshire or Vermont. All of these areas kind of like connect, but it was unclear exactly where she was planning on going. She also made a phone call to a uh, another nursing student. We don't know why or what the conversation was about. Um, but that was a phone call that she made in the early afternoon. And then at 1.24 p.m. she emailed her job and professors saying that she had a family emergency, a death in the family, and that she was going to be gone for a week. The family later confirmed that there was no death. There was no sort of emergency at all. This was just whatever excuse she was saying to go away for a week, it seems. She clearly was planning on going away. She had packed up, you know, stuff in her car. She actually had also packed up the majority of her dorm um, and left it in boxes though as if she was going to come back for it so it wasn't like she was totally gone maybe she was thinking of leaving school maybe you know school just wasn't working for her whatever the case may be so then we're moving on to later in the afternoon after all these phone calls are made she's packed up and everything she makes um a withdrawal from her bank account and she basically withdraws everything i think i already said we we're at 3 30 3 30 ish but i just finished this eye off camera so we were at 3 30 ish p.m and we she took almost all of her money out of her bank account and then she also went to the liquor store so that obviously was caught on camera after this point the last time that her cell phone pinged anywhere was at 4 37 p.m then we don't hear anything else until 7 30 p.m that night she spins out of control um, we are, it, remember this is winter time, we are in basically the mountains, kind of like the Berkshires. It's very slippery, I know from personal experience, you have to be very careful. The roads up here are very windy and long and there's not that many people out here. So if something happens, you probably aren't going to get help immediately. Um, cell phone reception is horrible. So she spun out and crashed her car at 7.30 p.m. on Route 112 in Haverhill, New Hampshire. We're going to come back to that. When this happened, a bus driver was somewhat behind her, not like steadily obviously following her, but steadily behind her. This is a super long road, so he could see very far ahead of him. Um, so he was behind her, and then once he caught up to her, he realized that she had spun out and she was on the side of the road. And he asked if she needed help, and she was like, no, I've already called AAA, I'm good. She definitely seemed distraught, but like, she was like, no, 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 I'm good, I have help on the way, which she did not. She did not call AAA. She had no help coming her way. It's unclear if she was drinking and driving because we know that she went to liquor store. So this poor girl is just a mess. When the bus driver got home, he did call it in just because he wanted to make sure that she kind of like was okay and got home safely. He probably also didn't have service. The service out here was awful. So I don't even think there was service. Um, so she probably couldn't even call the AAA if she wanted to, which if any of you don't know what AAA is, it's just like a roadside assistance service that's really popular. A lot of people have it. A local resident, also kind of like a neighbor, someone who lived nearby, also saw and heard the crash and called the police. Um, they didn't talk to more directly. It was a little old lady, but she just wanted to report it, basically. So the police have been notified. Maura does not know that. Um, it kind of seemed, the bus driver, driver said later on, when he asked if she needed help that she did not want the police to be called. She already called AAA and she did not want the police there. And that could easily be just because she was already on probation. So especially if she was drinking and driving like and she had crashed her dad's car so early. So it does make sense why she doesn't want the police there. So at 7.46 p.m. the police arrived and no one was at the vehicle. Mora is gone. Um, they don't even realize whose vehicle it is yet. They, you know, they don't know all the full details yet. They did say that there was a Coke bottle that was full of wine, which is one of the things that she purchased from the liquor store. So that's why a lot of people think that she was drinking and driving and probably why she didn't want the police to be called. They found, you know, still a lot of her belongings, but she didn't, she seemed to have taken with her um, her credit cards. Um, and her ID and some Kahlua, which was some of the alcohol that she brought. So I guess she was stressed out. She needed to take it with her. So they also found in the car, in addition to her belongings, her like packed up bags, which would have lasted her a little bit, um, a book about mountain climbing. And you know, we are in the Berkshires, we are in the cold wintry months and in the mountains. So maybe she, you know, it kind of makes sense that maybe she, when she was going away or whatever she was doing, 
that she wanted to explore and just kind of like be with nature. When they initially arrived on scene, they thought that whoever had the car was drinking and driving because of what they found with the Coke and the wine bottle and the wine inside and just fled the scene, which is normal. So they impounded the car. What they noticed too was that consistent with the crash, there were other damages to the car that were inconsistent to the crash. They could be from anything, but um, there has been some speculation that maybe somehow she was the hit and run driver and from earlier and maybe that's why she was so distraught or maybe someone had used her car and done it. So that was just something definitely of note when you look at the history of the events leading up to this. She also had a rag in her exhaust pipe, which I guess her dad told her to do to just help with some of the issues with the car. But again, just something that they noticed. Now this was reported much later, like three months later, that at 8 to 8.30ish p.m. a truck driver saw a young person moving quickly along the side of the road. We have no idea if it was Mora, this truck driver, um, got his dates mixed up and once he realized that on that day when he did see this that someone a young person had gone missing he decided to report it but there's n never really been any confirmation they couldn't really follow up with it he was you know it was late at night dark so just something to note but it didn't end up like amounting to anything that is basically the bulk of the information we do not know anything past that point about what happened to her she has never been seen again there has been no trace of her for the first two years after she disappeared her dad refused to be interviewed which a lot of people found like suspicious obviously i think that's pretty suspect if you ask me um but you know maybe he was just coached by a lawyer saying like you know you don't want to incriminate yourself maybe he knew that she was going somewhere and he wanted to keep her secret but he thought that she was going to come home and then he felt bad i mean there's so many reasons why obviously i do see why people think it's suspicious but ultimately they've never been able to link him to anything and then when he did interview he brought two lawyers with him so i mean who knows it is what it is they did a search the next day a dog had hit a scent for a little while but then lost it and then a few days later did like a full huge search with helicopters thermal cameras dogs you name it, didn't find anything. I'm gonna get into the theories in a little bit. There's just a couple more things I wanna say. This j did turn into a nationwide case. Um, the FBI actually did get involved at some point. So yeah, it, it was a decently big case, but we have no other further information. So at the end of 2004, remember this happened in February 2004, so the beginning of the year in 2004. At the end of 2004, a man allegedly gave the father a rusty old knife that belonged to the man's brother. Um, who lived I guess like a mile from where her car went missing and said that his brother and his girlfriend had been acting strange ever since he heard about this case so but I guess nothing came of it that was just all we kind of heard I, I think that the dad didn't take it seriously at first and then you know obviously he they looked into it and it didn't lead to anything so just a strange kind of note there and then also in October of 06 um a lead had led them to a certain house close to where the car had been where the car had crashed cadaver dogs went crazy for a little bit so they definitely feel like there were human remains there at some point in this man's basement but they were never able to connect it to any bodies and specifically not to Mora, of course as she's still missing and the creepiest thing out of all of this eight years ago today on the eighth anniversary of her disappearance a YouTube video was uploaded and the username for this channel and it was the only video they'd ever posted it seemed like it was created for this purpose the username on this channel was let me make sure I don't get it wrong 112 dirtbag I will insert something if I can find it even if it's a crappy recording that I get off my phone because I'm pretty sure the video has been removed the username was 112 dirtbag and this ties back to where her car crashed her car crashed on route 112 in Haverhill New Hampshire and in an interview you know later on her dad had said maybe some dirtbag on 112 picked her up and kidnapped her so his username for this YouTube video was 112 dirtbag and it's just this old man, he has glasses, and he's just laughing.
for like a minute and it just gets more kind of like maniacal is that the word like more sinister almost like a cackle like an evil laugh it just gets more and more and more and that's it that's the whole video and that happened eight years after so eight years ago today that happened and i just thought that was so strange that was like some conspiracy kind of stuff and i guess again it led to nowhere so that is pretty much all the information if you guys have any more information let me know down below please because if i miss anything i want us to talk about it and let's get into like the theories so i think the one that most people believe um is that she really was just trying to run away she was in trouble so a lot of people think that she was just trying to get away she was in trouble she was on probation and she just crashed two cars probably drunk both times um she could have been just get, trying to get away in general with all the stuff that she'd been dealing with P potentially whatever happened that made her so distraught that night a few nights ago maybe had also something to do with this but a lot of people think that she just ran away and it went all wrong um maybe she did it successfully and we'll never know <laughs> maybe she's living under a totally different name and you know because she's a runner some people think that she really did get away and survived and you know maybe stayed like got into someone else's house and you know told her she was a runaway or something and that she was just needed a place to sleep for the night or whatever it may be so there's a lot of people that believe that i think that's the one that i believe the most as well and then really the only other theory is that she was kidnapped um unfortunately you know potentially she was kidnapped murdered so there's really not too many theories but i think a lot of people think given the circumstances and her strange behaviors leading up to everything that she was clearly trying to run away from something and she hasn't been seen since it's been 16 years so she would be 35 or i'm sorry 45 now so that is the case of maura murray if you guys have any more information please let me know down below leave any links articles i'll leave some sources that i have down below as well um but i find this case just so interesting especially because like the majority of well pretty much all the evidence besides things that just occur after the disappearance is before and then there's literally no trace like she truly did just disappear and this happened right when social media was starting kind of starting you know facebook was about it but still like if this had happened maybe a few years later i wonder if it would have had a different outcome so yeah i hope that you like this video this is the first one i've done like this i hope you like the look that i created if you still want me to do lizzie borden let me know by giving this video a thumbs up and or letting me down in the comments it's such a famous case but it is still kind of fascinating and there was actually a newer theory that kind of evolved i think in 2018 so if you guys want that just let me know or if you have any other suggestions of other cases you want me to do for a sketchy saturday or sketchy sunday please let me know in the comments down below i think that's it thank you so so much for watching and make sure you like subscribe hit your notification bell so you don't miss my next video i hope to see you there and i hope you have a lovely day Bye, guys.